The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I'm going to talk today about um, a couple of things. I had a hell of a time constructing a nice, clean narrative arc through everything I wanted to say, and so I finally just decided the hell with it. I'm just going to be honest. There's several different pieces. They don't make a narrative arc. That's life. Uh, I want to address um, uh, what I see as a sort of macroscopic view of the organization of the human brain as giving us a kind of picture of what I'm going to call the architecture of human intelligence. Right? We're trying to understand intelligence in this class, and so I think the overall organization of the human brain, in which we've made a lot of progress in the last 20 years, gives us a kind of macro picture of what the pieces of the system are. So I'll talk about that, and then I'll also, if I talk fast enough, um, do a kind of whirlwind um, introduction through the basic methods of human cognitive neuroscience using uh, face recognition as uh, an example to illustrate what each of the methods can and cannot do. So that's the agenda. Um, it's going to be pretty basic, so if you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard a lot of this. So. Uh, anyway, the key question we're trying to address in this course is how does the brain produce intelligent behavior uh, and how may we be able to replicate that intelligence in machines? Okay, and so there's of course a million different ways to go at that uh, question um, and you can go at it from a kind of computational angle, a coding perspective, from a fine-grained neural circuit perspective, and I'm going to do something that's kind of in between because um, those are the things we can approach uh, in human brains, and it's really human intelligence we want to understand. I'd say some of human intelligence is, a lot of it is are, uh, things that we share with animals, but some of it is not. And so uh, I think it's important to um, be able to approach this not just from the uh, perspectives of animal research, magnificent as those methods are, but to also see what we can learn about human brains. Okay, so. I'll talk a bit about the overall functional architecture of the human brain, what are the basic pieces of the system, and then I'll get into some, uh, some different methods and what they tell us about, about face perception. Okay, so at the most general level, we can ask whether human intelligence, as people have been asking for centuries actually, whether human intelligence is the product of a bunch of very special purpose components, each optimized to solve a specific problem, uh, kind of like this device here, where you have uh, a saw for cutting wood, scissors for cutting paper. Um, saws don't work that well on paper, and scissors don't work that well on wood. Um, or whether uh, human intelligence is the product of some more kind of generic, all-purpose computational power that makes us um, generically smart without optimizing us for any particular tasks. Uh, and just to foreshadow the answer, as in all questions in psychology, the answer is both. Uh, but we'll do that in some detail. Uh, before we get into that, who cares? Uh, and I'd say, first of all, this kind of macro level question about functional components of the human mind and brain matters for a bunch of reasons. First of all, I just think it's one of the most basic questions we can ask about, uh, about ourselves, about who we are, um, is to ask what the basic pieces are of our minds. Um, second, more pragmatically, uh, this kind of divide and conquer research strategy has been effective in lots of different fields that are trying to understand a com complex system. What do you do with this incredibly complex system where you just can't even figure out how to get started? Well, one sensible way to get started is first figure out what its pieces are and then maybe try to figure out how each of the pieces work and then maybe someday, maybe not in my lifetime, figure out how they all work together in some um, coordinated fashion. Uh, and third, somewhat more subtly, um, of course we want to know not just what the pieces are, but what the computations that are performed in each of those pieces and what the representations extracted in each piece are. And I think even just a functional characterization of the scope of a particular brain region already gives us some important clues about the kinds of computations that go on there. Right? So if we find that there's a part of the brain that's primarily involved in face recognition, not in reading visually presented words, recognizing scenes, or recognizing objects, that already gives us some clues about the kinds of um, computations that would be appropriate for that scope of task. Right? So if you tried to write the code to do that, you'd be writing very different code if it only had to do face recognition versus if it also had to be able to recognize 
words and scenes and objects presented visually. Okay, so that's my um, list of the main reasons. And of course, there are heaps of different ways to uh, investigate this question. Um, and um, uh, I'll, I'll mention some of those in the second half, but I want to start with um, Spearman, uh, who published a paper in 1904 in the American Journal of Psychology. This article was sandwiched between a discussion of the soul uh, and an article on the psychology of the English sparrow. And in this article, um, Spearman did the following low-tech but fascinating thing. Um, he tested a whole bunch of kids in two different schools on a wide variety of different tasks. And this included scholastic achievement type things. He got exam grades from each student in a bunch of different classes. And he measured a whole bunch of other kinds of psychological abilities, including some very kind of psychophysical perceptual discrimination abilities. How well could people discriminate the, brightness, the loudness of two different tones, the brightness of two different flashes of light, the weight of two different um, pieces of stuff? Uh, and what he found, well, before I tell you what he found, what, do you, what would you expect with this? Should we expect a correlation between your ability to discriminate two different loudnesses and say your math score in grade five uh, on a math exam. Spearman's main result is that most pairs of tasks were correlated with each other. That is, if you were good at one, you were good at the others. Even tasks that seemingly have very little to do with each other. And this is the basis of the whole idea of G, which is the general factor, and which is what led to the whole idea of IQ and IQ testing. And in America, we're very uptight about the idea of IQ. Brits don't seem to have a problem with this idea. They're very enthusiastic about the idea, and always have been. Um, but um, the, aside from all the social uses and misuses of IQ tests, the point is there's actually a deep discovery about psychology that Spearman made from the fact that all of these tests were correlated with each other. He didn't know what it was, kind of like Gregor Mendel inferring genes without knowing anything about molecular biology. Spearman just inferred there's something general about the human intellect such that there are these strong correlations about ta across tasks. Okay, so that's G, um, but less uh, well known about Spearman's work is he also talked about the specific factor, S. And S was the fact that although the broad uh, result of his experiments was that most pairs of tasks were correlated, there were some tasks that weren't so strongly correlated with others, and that you could factor those out and discover some mental abilities that weren't just you know, broadly shared across subjects. Um, and I think this kind of foreshadows everything that we see with functional MRI. There's a lot of specific S's, and there's also some G, and you can see those in different brain regions, as I will detail next. Another method uh, was invented by uh, Franz Joseph Gall, uh, and he argued that there are distinct mental faculties that live in different parts of the brain, right? which I think is more or less right, as I'll argue. But you know, Gall lived in the 1700s, and he didn't have an MRI machine. So he did the best he could, which wasn't so hot. Uh, he invented the infamous method of phrenology. He felt the bumps on the skull and tried to relate those to specific abilities of different individuals, and from this inferred uh, 27 mental faculties. My favorites are amativeness, filial piety, and veneration. Um, and so, you know, there's a kernel of the right idea, but kind of the wrong method. Um, and uh, another method that was, uh, er, you know, very early one um, was the method of studying the loss of specific mental abilities after brain damage. Um, and so Florence, who's often credited as being the first experimental neuroscientist, um, went around making lesions in uh, pigeons and rabbits uh, and, didn't, and then testing them on various things. And he didn't really find much uh, difference in what parts of the brain he took out for their mental abilities. Maybe that's because he wasn't such a hot uh, experimental, you know, he didn't have great experimental methods. Uh, in any case, he argued that all sensory and volitional faculties exist in the cerebral hemispheres and must be regarded as occupying concurrently the same seat in those structures, right? In other words, everything is on top of everything else in the brain, okay? So that was a sort of, you know, um, uh, dominant view for a while. People thought uh, Gall was kind of a crackpot, even though he wrote very popular books and went around Europe giving popular lectures that huge numbers of people attended. Um, the respectable intellectual society didn't take him seriously. 
Uh, in fact, the whole idea of localization of function wasn't taken seriously until Paul Broca, uh, a member of the, um, the French Academy, stood up in front of the Society of Anthropology uh, in Paris in 1861 and announced that the left frontal lobe is the seat of speech. And this was based on his patient, Tan, whose brain is shown here. Uh, Tan was named Tan because that was all he could say after damage to his left inferior frontal lobe. And Broca pointed out that Tan had lots of other mental faculties preserved, and it was simply speech that was disrupted. And from this uh, was kind of one of the first respectable people to uh, argue for localization of function. OK, so this, this uh, research program goes on. And by the end of the 20th century, there's pretty much agreement that basic sensory and motor functions do uh, exhibit localization of function in the brain. There are different regions for basic visual processing, auditory processing, and so forth. And that was no longer controversial. Um, but the whole question of whether higher level mental functions uh, were localized in distinct parts of the brain um, was controversial then and remains controversial now. Um, and so um, the method I'll focus on uh, is functional MRI because I think it's played a huge role in addressing this question at this kind of macroscopic level. Uh, and I think you guys know what an MRI machine is, in case anybody's been on Mars for a while. Uh, it, uh, it, the important part is its measure is uh, a very indirect measure of neural activity by way of a long causal chain, neurons fire, um, uh, you incur metabolic cost um, and blood flow changes to that region. Blood flow uh, increase more than compensates for oxygen use, producing a local um, decrease rather than the expected increase uh, in deoxyhemoglobin relative to oxyhemoglobin. Those two are magnetically different. That's what the MRI uh, machine detects. It's very indirect, so it's remarkable it works as well as it does. Uh, and it's currently the best non-invasive method we have in humans uh, in terms of both spatial, um, uh, having both spatial, well, spatial resolution, not temporal resolution. Okay, so, um, uh, and many of you are already diving into the details of some of the data we collected, but in case you're on other projects and are uh, coming from other fields, the basic format of a t the data in a typical functional MRI study is you have tens of thousands of three-dimensional pixels or voxels uh, that you scan. Um, and um, those typically you sample a whole set once every two seconds or so. You can push it and do it every second or less under special circumstances. Uh, you can have more voxels by sampling at higher resolution, but that's a ballpark of the format of the kind of movie you can get of brain activity. OK, so a few things about the uh, the method and its limitations, because they're really important uh, in terms of what you can learn from functional MRI and what you can't. So first of all, this is a timeline. My x-axis, even though it's invisible, is time uh, in seconds. And so if you imagine looking at V1 um, and presenting a brief, say, tenth of a second high contrast flash of a checkerboard, what we know from neurophysiology is that neurons fire within 100 milliseconds of a visual onset. The information gets right up there really fast. Um, the BOLD, which stands for blood oxygenation level dependent, or functional MRI response, is way lagged behind this. Okay, So the neurons are firing way over here in this graph, essentially at time zero, a tenth of a second. But the uh, MRI response is six seconds later. Okay, So it's really slow. Um, and that has a bunch of implications about what we can and cannot learn from it. So first of all, because it's so slow, um, we, we can't resolve the steps in a computation uh, for fast systems like vision and hearing and language understanding, systems for which we have dedicated machinery that's highly efficient, where you can recognize the gist of a scene within a quarter of a second of when it flashes on a screen in front of you. That, and, and similarly, you understand the meaning of a sentence so rapidly that you've already parsed much of the sentence um, you know, well before the sentence is over. Right? So these are extremely efficient, rapid mental processes. That means the component steps in those mental processes happen over um, 10 or a few tens of milliseconds. And we're off, way off in temporal resolution with functional MRI. All of those things are squashed together on top of each other. 
Um, that's a drag, that's just life. We can't see those individual component steps with functional MRI. Um, the second thing is that the spatial resolution is the best that we have in humans non-invasively right now, but it's absolutely awful compared to what you can do in animals. So I missed Jim DiCarlo's talk yesterday, but, um, but uh, those methods are spectacular. You can record from individual neurons, record their precise activity with beautiful time information. In contrast, functional MRI is like, um, you know, the dark ages. Uh, we have typically hundreds of thousands of neurons in each voxel. Okay, so the real miracle of functional MRI is if we ever see anything at all, rather than just garbage because you're summing over so many neurons at once. And it's just a lucky fact of the organization of the human brain that you have clusterings of neurons with similar um, response selectivities and similar functions at such a macro grain that you can see some stuff with functional MRI, although you miss a lot as well. Um, the third important limit of functional MRI that comes out of just a consideration of what the, the method measures um, is that you can only uh, really see differences between conditions with functional MRI. The magnitude of the MRI response in a voxel at a time point is meaningless. It might be, you know, 563, and that's all it means. Nothing, right? It means nothing. It's just the bright, you know, the intensity of the MRI signal. The only way to make it mean something is to compare it to something else, usually two different tasks or two different stimuli. And so you can go far with that, but it's important to realize you can't tra translate it into any kind of absolute measure of neural activity. It's only a relative measure of um, strength of neural activity um, between two different, two or more different conditions. Okay, and the final, uh, you know, deep limitation of functional MRI is that we don't, we, we use this, this convenient phrase, neural activity. It's very convenient because it's extremely vague. Uh, and fittingly so, because we don't know exactly what kind of neural activity is driving the Bolton response. It could be spikes or action potentials. It could be synaptic, synaptic activity that doesn't lead to spikes. It could be tonic inhibition. It could be all kinds of different things. Anything that's metabolically expensive is likely to increase the blood, um, blood flow response. In practice, when people have looked at it, it's very nicely correlated with firing rate. Right, with some you know, bumps and caveats, so you can never be totally sure, but there's, um, it's a pretty good proxy for firing rate. You just need to remember in the back of your mind that it could be other stuff too. The final very important caveat is that functional MRI, like, like you know, most other methods where you're just recording neural activity in a variety of different ways, you're just watching. You're not intervening, and that means you're not measuring the causal role of the things you measure. And that's very important because it could be that everything you measure is just completely epiphenomenal and has absolutely nothing to do with behavior, okay? So in practice, that's unlikely that you have all the systematic stuff for no reason, uh, but you need to kind of keep in mind that functional MRI is not, uh, it affords no window at all into the causal role of different regions. For that, you need to complement it with other methods, okay? So despite all these limitations, I think functional MRI has had a huge impact on the field. Uh, and, and admittedly, I'm biased, but I think it's one of these things where as it happens, you know, we get so used to a result the minute it gets published. It was like, oh yeah, right, one of these, one of those, so what? Um, but I think it's important to step back. So I made a bunch of pictures to, to show you why I think this is important. Okay, here is Penfield's map, functional map of the human brain, published in 1957, the year before I was born. And he has six, count them six, functional regions labeled in there. You probably can't see them, but it's the basic sensory and motor regions, visual cortex, auditory cortex, motor cortex, um, speech up here in Broca's area, and then my favorite is this word that says interpretive. Nice, okay. Anyway, this was based on um, electrical recording and stimulation in patients with epilepsy uh, who were undergoing um, brain surgery. Uh, actually a very powerful method, but that's where it got him. He published this near the end of his career, and that's nice, but it's pretty rudimentary. Okay, now, cut to 1990, immediately before the advent, advent of functional MRI, and I, this is really crude, the black outlines are the basic sensory and motor regions, and I've added a couple of big colored blobs for regions that had been identified by studying patients with brain damage. So, uh, you know, even from Broca and Wernicke, it was known that approximately these regions were involved in language because people with damage there lost their language abilities. 
you get whacked in your parietal lobe, you have weird attentional problems like neglecting the left half of space and stuff like that. Uh, if you have damage somewhere to the back end of the right hemisphere, you might lose face recognition ability. These things were known by around 1990, not much else. That's basically the functional map of the brain 1990. Okay, may seem, that probably seems like ancient history to a lot of you, but not to me. Um, okay, here we are today. Okay, there's a lot of stuff we've learned, right? There are a lot of particular parts of the human brain uh, which have been, um, uh, whose function has been characterized quite precisely. Not in the sense that we know the precise circuits in there or that we can very precisely characterize the representations or computations, but to the sense that we know that a region may be very selectively involved, for example, in thinking about what other people are thinking. A totally remarkable result that Rebecca Sachs, who discovered it, will, will tell you about when she's here next week. Okay, so that was completely unknown um, even 15 years ago, let alone back in 1990. Uh, and likewise, most of these other regions were known only in, you know, either known in the blurriest sense or not with this precision. So I think even though this is very limited and it's kind of step zero in trying to understand the human brain, um, I think it's important progress. And I think to push a little farther, I'd like to see this as an admittedly very blurry, uh, but still a picture of the architecture of human intelligence. What are the basic pieces? What is it we have in here to work with when we think? We have these basic pieces, a bunch more that haven't been discovered yet, and a lot more that we need to know about each of these and how they interact and all of that, but you know, a reasonable beginning, okay? All right, so that's my um, story here, okay, for fun. This is me with uh, a bunch of functional regions identified in my brain. And so the argument I'm making here is that the human mind and brain contains a set of highly specialized components, each solving a different specific problem. Um, and that each of these regions is present in essentially every normal person. It's just part of the basic architecture of the human mind and brain. Uh, now, this view um, is pretty simple, but nonetheless, it's um, often confused with a whole bunch of other things that people think are the same thing and that aren't. So it's starting to drive me insane, so I'm gonna take five minutes and go through the things this does not mean. Um, and, um, okay, uh, I hope this doesn't insult your intelligence, but it's amazing how in the current literature in the field, people conflate these things. Okay, so I'm talking about functional specificity, which is a question of whether this particular region right here is engaged in pretty selectively in just that particular mental process and not lots of other mental processes. Okay, that's what I mean by functional specificity. That's a different idea than anatomical specificity. Anatomical specificity would say it is only this region that's involved and nothing else is involved. That's a different question, right? How specific is this region versus are there other regions that do something similar? Also an interesting question, but a different one, okay? I'm gonna go through this fast, so if any of it doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and I'll... Um, Explain it more. Okay, uh, yet another idea is the necessity of a brain region for a particular function. That's actually what we really wanna know with the functional specificity question is not just does it only turn on when you do X, but do you absolutely need it for X? Um, and so that's actually a, a, a central question that's, that's closely connected to it's really part of uh, functional specificity. This is the causal question. Um, it's different from the question of sufficiency. Right, is a given brain region sufficient for a mental process? Well, I think that's just kind of a wrong-headed question because nothing's ever sufficient. It's just kind of a confused idea. I mean, what would that mean? That would mean we excise my face area, we put it in a dish, keep all the neurons alive. Let's pretend we could do that. I'm sure Ed Boyden could figure out how to do that in a weekend. Yeah. Um, and so we have this thing alive in a dish. Can it do face recognition? Well, of course not. You gotta get the information in there in the right format, and if the information doesn't get out and inform the rest of a brain, it's not, doesn't house a face percept, right? So you need things to be connected up, uh, uh, and that you need lots of other brain regions to be involved. So let's distinguish whether this brain region is functionally specific for a process from whether it's sufficient for the whole process. Of course it's not sufficient, okay? All right. I know you guys would never say anything so dumb. Uh, okay, a question of connectivity, right? So um, people often say, um, oh, well this, this region is part of a network, period. And my reaction is like, duh, of course it's part of a network. Everything's part of a network. In no way 
does that engage with the question of whether that region is functionally specific, right? A functionally specific region, of course, is part of a network. It talks to other brain regions. Those other brain regions may play an important role in its processing, sure. At the very least, they're necessary for getting the information in and out and using it, okay? Okay. Um, all right. Um, the final thing that people confuse uh, with functional specificity is innateness. Um, this is a very different concept, right? Just because we have some particular part of the brain for which we may get really strong evidence that it's very specifically involved in mental process X, that's cool, that's important. That's completely orthogonal to how it got wired up and whether it's um, innately specified in the genome, that whole circuit, or whether that circuit is um, instructed by experience over development or as in the usual case, very complicated combinations of those two. Okay, so just to remind you that functional specificity is a different question from innateness. Uh, and one way you can see that uh, very clearly is to consider the case of the visual word form area, uh, about which I'll show you some data in a moment. Uh, the visual word form area responds selectively to words and letter strings in an orthography you know, not an orthography you don't know. It's very anatomically stereotyped. Mine is approximately right there. Um, and so is yours in your brain. Um, and it responds to orthographies you know. If you can read Arabic and Hebrew, yours also responds when you look at words in Arabic and Hebrew. If you can't, it doesn't, or it responds a whole lot less. Okay, so that's a function of your individual experience, not your ancestor's experience. It has strong functional specificity, and yet its functional specificity is not innate. So this idea that I'm staking out here has become kind of unpopular. It's very trendy to say, oh, of course, we know the brain doesn't have specialized components. So for example, uh, here's from a textbook, um, Scott Utel, unlike the phrenologists who believe this very stupid idea that very complex traits were associated with discrete brain regions, modern researchers recognize that a single brain, brain region may participate in more than one function. Well, he built in the hedge word, may, so we can't really have a fight. But you know, he's trying to stake out this different view. Um, Lisa uh, Feldman Barrett, I haven't met her, but she's driving me insane. Uh, most recently, by proclaiming all kinds of things in the New York Times just a few weeks ago, quote, um, in general, the workings of the brain are not one-to-one, -one, whereby a given region has a distinct psychological purpose. Um, right, well, she's got hedge words in general. I've, we all have hedge words, but you know, she's, she's basically what she's reasoning from is the fact that her data suggests that specific emotions don't inhabit specific brain regions from the idea that the whole brain has no localization of function. Well, that's idiotic. It's just idiotic, right? Okay, so I hope that people will stop these fast and loose arguments. Uh, but here's my favorite, um, this old coot, Utal. I know this is gonna be on the web, and here I am carrying on as if we have, anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> this guy cracks me up. He's been publishing, every year he publishes another book, kind of going after functional MRI. Any studies using brain images that report single areas of activation exclusively associated with a particular cognitive process should be a priori considered to be artifacts of the arbitrary threshold set by the investigators and seriously questioned. You go. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's fun. Uh, anyway, my point is just um, that we should engage in the data, right? This isn't like an ideology where we can just proclaim our opinions, there are data that speak to it. So let me show you some of mine. Um, okay, so what would be evidence of functional specificity? There are lots of ways of doing it. The way I like to do it uh, is something called the functional region of interest method. Um, the, uh, the problem is that although there are very systematic regularities in the functional organization of the brain, each of these regions that I'm talking about is in approximately the same location in each normal subject their actual location varies a bit from subject to subject. So if you do the standard thing of aligning brains and averaging across them, you get a lot of mush. Uh, and yet there isn't much mush in each subject individually. And so to deal with that problem and to deal with a bunch of other problems, we use something called a functional region of interest method. And that means if you want to study a given region, you find it in that subject individually. And then once you've found it, with a simple contrast. You want to find a face region, you find a region that responds more when people look at faces than when they look at objects. Now you found it in that subject. It's these 85 voxels right there in that subject. Now we run a new experiment uh, to test more interesting questions about it and we measure the response in those voxels, okay? 
That also has the advantage that the data you plot and look at is independent of the way you found those voxels, a very important problem in a lot of functional neuroimaging where people have non-independent statistical problems with their data analysis. If you have a functional region of interest that's localized independently of the data you look at in it, you get out of that problem. It's also a huge benefit because one of the central problems with functional brain imaging, which I think has led to the fact that a large percent of the published neuroimaging findings are probably noise, um, is that there are just too many degrees of freedom. You have tens of thousands of voxels. You have loads of different places to look and ways to analyze your data. One of the things I love dearly about the functional region of interest method is that you tie your hands in a really good way, right? So you're, you're specifying in advance exactly where you're going to look, and you specify exactly how you're going to quantify the response, and so you have no degrees of freedom. And that gives you a huge statistical advantage, and it means you're less likely to be inadvertently publishing papers on noise. Okay, so that's the functional region of interest method. Um, here's just, we've done loads of these experiments. Here's just from a current experiment in my lab being conducted by Zainab Sagan. Um, she's actually looking at connectivity of different brain regions using a different method. I probably won't have time to talk about it. It's very cool. But in the process, she's run a whole bunch of functional localizers. And so we can look in her data at the response of the fusiform face area to a whole bunch of different conditions. Okay, so these are a bunch of auditory and language conditions. So, okay, not too surprising. It doesn't respond very much to those. They're presented auditorily. But these are all visual stimuli here. The two yellow bars are faces. This is line drawings of faces. This is video clips, color video clips of faces, strong responses to both. And all of these other conditions, um, line drawings of objects, movies of objects, movies of scenes, scrambled objects, words, scrambled words, bodies, all produce much lower responses. Okay? So um, I would say this is pretty strong selectivity. It's been tested against lots of alternatives, uh, only a tiny percent of which are shown here. Um, as I mentioned before, it's present in more or less the same place in pretty much every normal subject. I think it's just a basic piece of mental architecture. Now, this is a very simple univariate measure. We're just measuring the very crude thing of the overall magnitude of MRI response in that region to these conditions. Um, there are legitimate counterarguments to the simple-minded view I'm putting forth, um, and we should consider them. I think the most important one comes from pattern analysis methods, which I will talk about if I uh, get there. Um, and importantly, um, these data don't tell us about the causal role of that region. Um, uh, we'll return to those. However, the point is, before we blithely say it's not fashionable to talk about functional specificity, we need counterarguments to data like this. Okay? They're pretty strong. And you know, that's just one example to show you just a few others from um, Zainab's paper. Um, okay, so this is what I just showed you, but um, in the same experiment, uh, we can look at other brain regions. Okay, so the, this is a bottom surface of the, um, of the brain there, so this is the occipital pole, front of the head, bottom of the temporal lobe. That face area is the region in yellow in this subject. This purple region is that visual word form area that I mentioned, and here is its response magnitude across a whole bunch of subjects, localizing and then independently testing. The purple bars are when, uh, sorry, subjects are looking at visually presented words. And again, all these other conditions, faces, objects, bodies, scenes, you know, listening to words, all of those things, much lower response, OK? Um, uh, in the same experiment, we can also look at uh, a set of regions that respond to speech. I mentioned those very briefly in my introduction a few days ago. Um, these are regions a number of people have found. Um, in this case, what we, they're immediately below um, or lateral to primary auditory cortex in humans, interestingly situated right between primary auditory cortex and language sensitive regions. Right between is a set of regions that respond to the sounds of speech, okay? Not to the content of language, but the sounds of speech. Um, and so this is when people are just, um, hang on just a second, this is when people are saying stuff like bada ga, bada ga. So they're just lying in the scanner saying bada ga, bada ga. And here's when they're, um, tapping their fingers in a systematic order. Um, here's when they're listening to sentences. Importantly, this is when they're listening to um, jabberwocky gobbledygook that's meaningless. Okay, So no meaning, but phonemes, same response. That's what tells us that this region is involved in processing the sounds of speech, not the content of language. 
and low to everything else. So um, other things, uh, moving outside of uh, perceptual regions, you might say, okay, fine, perception is an inherently modular process. There's different kinds of perceptual problems. That makes sense. But high-level cognition, we wouldn't really have functional specificity for that. But oh, yes, we do. Uh, here are some um, language regions. Um, there's a bunch of them in the temporal and frontal lobe that have been known since Wernicke and Broca. But now with functional MRI, we can identify them in individual subjects and go back and repeatedly query them and say, are they involved in all of these other mental processes? So this is now the response uh, in a language region so identified. Here's the response when you're listening to sentences. This is when you're listening to jabberwocky nonsense strings. Uh, here's when you're saying badaga badaga. It's not just speech sounds. Here's when you're listening to um, synthetically decomposed speech sounds that are acoustically very similar to the Jabberwocky speech. It's just not interested in those things. It seems to be interested in something more like the meaning of a sentence. Uh, and just to show you some other data we have on this, this is data from Ev Fedorenko, who has tested um, this region, now this is sort of roughly Broca's area, um, on the main um, mental functions that people have argued overlap in the brain with language. Um, namely, sorry, this is probably hard to see here, but um, uh, arithmetic, so we have difficult and easy mental arithmetic, um, intact and scrambled music in pink, um, a bunch of working memory tasks, spatial working memory and verbal working memory, and a bunch of cognitive control tasks, just kind of attention demanding tasks where you have to uh, switch between tasks and stuff like that. And here is the response profile in that region. Reading sentences, reading non-word strings. All of those other tasks, both the difficult and the easy version, no response at all. That's extreme functional specificity, right? It's not that we've tested everything. There's more to be done. But the first pass querying of, um, you know, do those language regions engage in all of these other things that people thought might overlap with language? The answer is no, they don't, right? And, interest, and I think that's really deep and, and interesting because it means that you know, this, this basic question that we all, you know, start asking ourselves when we're young is, what is the relationship between language and thought? Um, I know Liz disagrees with me somewhat on this. Uh, that's because she's very articulate and she doesn't feel the difference between an idea and its articulation. I'm less articulate. It's very obvious to me they're different things. Um, no, it's not the only reason she has data to, uh, and it'd be fun to discuss. But um, I think there's a, a vast gulf between the two and that all, many different aspects of cognition can proceed just fine uh, without language regions. And actually, the stronger evidence for that comes not from these functional MRI data, striking as I think they are, but from patient data. So Rosemary Varley in England has been testing patients with global aphasia. This is this very tragic, horrible thing that happens in patients who have massive left hemisphere strokes that pretty much take out essentially all of their language abilities. Um, those people, she has shown, are intact in their navigation abilities, their arithmetic abilities, their ability to solve logic problems, their ability to think about what other people are thinking, their ability to appreciate music, and so on and so forth. So I think there's really a, uh, a very big difference between a major part of the system that you need to understand the meaning of a sentence and all of those other aspects of thought. This is just showing you what I mean by functional specificity, what the evidence, what the basic first order evidence is. Um, and these are just the regions that we happen to have in this study, so I could make a new slide. But for lots of other um, perceptual and cognitive functions, people have found quite specific brain regions for perceiving bodies and scenes. Of course, motion, the um, uh, area MT has been studied for a long time. Regions that are quite, quite specifically involved in processing shape. Uh, we've been studying color processing regions recently. They're not as selective for color as some of these other regions, but they're very anatomically um, consistent. Um, and um, uh, things I mentioned before in my brief introduction, uh, regions that are specifically involved in processing pitch information and music information. Uh, and as you'll hear next week from uh, Rebecca Sachs, uh, theory of mind or thinking about other people's thoughts. And so there's quite a litany um, uh, of of mental functions that have brain regions that are quite specifically engaged to that mental function. And each of these, to varying degrees, but to you know, some appreciable degree, have corroborating evidence from patients who have that specific deficit. 
So that shows that each of these has, uh, is likely to be uh, not only activated during, but causally involved in uh, its mental function. And as I mentioned, there are actually good counter arguments to some of the things I've been making that are worth discussing. I think the pattern analysis data is the strongest. Um, uh, oh, and I do need to take a few more minutes. I just like five or something. Okay. So all of that's to say, so here's you know, roughly where we are now. There are counter arguments, but um, loose talk about, oh, there's no localization of function in the brain. You got to engage with this at first and give me a serious counter argument, right? Um, okay. Uh, finally, I want to say that the, it's not that the whole brain is like this, right? There are, it's, there, there are big gray patches where we haven't figured out uh, what it's doing, but there are also substantial patches that are, have already been shown to be, in some sense, the opposite of this. Regions are in almost any difficult task you do at all. And I think this is a very interesting part of the whole story of the architecture of intelligence, so I'm going to take five minutes and tell you about it. This work is primarily the work of John Duncan in England, and he's been pointing out for about 15 years uh, that there are regions in the um, and frontal lobe, shown here, um, that are engaged in pretty much any difficult task you do. Anytime you increase the difficulty of a task, whether it's perceptual or high-level cognitive, those regions turn on differentially. Uh, and so that's why he calls them multiple demand. They respond to multiple different kinds of demand. Um, and so, um, right, Duncan argues that these regions are related to fluid intelligence. So remember Spearman, who I started with, who talks about the, uh, the general factor G. Um, well, Duncan thinks that basically this is the seat of G, these regions here, to oversimplify his argument. Uh, evidence for that. Um, and one is, um, uh, well, they're strongly activated when you do classic G-loading tasks. That's not that surprising. They're activated in all different kinds of tasks. More interestingly, um, he did a large patient study where they found 80 or so patients in their uh, neuropsych patients in their patient database, and they identified the lo locus of the brain damage in each of those patients. And what they did was they measured um, post-injury IQ. They estimated from a variety of sources pre-injury IQ, and they asked, how much does your IQ go down after brain damage as a function of, one, the volume of tissue you lost in your brain damage, and two, the locus of tissue, okay? And basically what he finds is, if you lose tissue in these regions, your IQ goes down. If you lose tissue elsewhere, you may become paralyzed or aphasic or prosopagnosic. You don't lose your, your IQ does not go down. Okay, in fact, he made a kind of ghoulish calculation that you lose six and a half IQ points for every 10 cubic centimeters of this region of cortex, <laughs> uh, and almost nothing for, um, for the rest of the brain. So, you know, this is kind of crude. It's, you know, it's very imperfect what you can get from patient studies. Uh, but I think it's um, intriguing. And so his suggestion is that in addition to these highly specialized cortical regions that we use for these, these particular important tasks, we also have this kind of general purpose machinery that makes us generically smart. Um, and I'm going to skip our own. We, we've tested this more seriously. He did group analyses, which I don't like. We did it in collaboration with him with individual subject analyses, the most precise measurements we could make. And boy, is he right. I mean, he's, even to the voxel, you can find that these regions are engaged in seven or eight very, very different kinds of cognitive demand all activate the same voxel differentially. Um, so the basic story I'm putting forth here, without the whole second half of my talk, I'm sorry about that, um, is that, um, is that the, at a macro scale, the architecture of human intelligence is that we have these special purpose bits for a small-ish number of important mental functions. Uh, not all of them innate, maybe some of them. Uh, in addition, we have some general purpose machinery. There's loads more that we don't know from the precise computations that go on in these things, to their connectivity, to um, the, the, you know, the actual precise representations that you can see with the neural code if you could measure it, which we can't in humans, to the timing of the, these re interactions, which of them are uniquely human, which of them are also present in monkeys. Um, and um, I don't have time to go find the slide, but one of the things we've been doing recently is looking in the ventral visual pathway at the organization of uh, face, place, and color selectivity. And what we see 
is that um, this is, we is me and Bevel Conway and Rosa, Rosa Lafer Souza. Uh, Bevel and Rosa had previously shown that on the lateral surface in the monkey, you have three bands of selectivity. So it goes face selectivity, uh, color selectivity, place selectivity, and three bands on the uh, side of the temporal lobe in monkeys. What we find is in humans, you have exactly the same organization in the same order, but it's rolled around on the ventral surface of the brain in the same order face, color, place on the bottom of the brain. So we think that whole broad region is homologous between monkeys uh, and humans. It just rolled around on the bottom. Maybe it got pushed over something. Um, and that's not exactly a novel argument. Actually, Vinrick wrote a paper suggesting this a while back. Um, and I think we're starting to see those homologies. And the reason that's important is that it means that all these questions we desperately want to answer um, about the you know, causal role, connectivity, population codes, uh, interactions between regions, development, all of that that we can't answer very well in humans, Vinrick can answer in monkeys. And after a break, he will tell you about all of that. All right.